Greetings. We are the Empyrean, travelers of the void. All right. Well, I'm just going to put you in here as void people, okay? Interest in Megatol Rex. We do not know of this which you speak. Great. That is... That's great. And when would you be looking to enter our universe? Whenever the fates have willed it. I can do next Tuesday? By the way, I've got six mates with me. Birdman, robot, big cat. Big cat? Are you... Oh, we've got names, mate. Listen, it's already pretty busy. Best I can say at this point is uh, I'll ha see what I ha can do. That's the punchline for this whole... That's the punchline. Are you serious? It's been a tough year. So this is Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, a game so big that the box itself requires its own tiny table. And today we've got the expansion that makes it even bigger. And so big in fact that on the table I'm filming this on, I can only set the game up for about one and a half players. If you don't know what Twilight Imperium is, then you're in the wrong place. But that's cool. Don't worry about it. My friend Quinns with the review of the original version of this game will have you covered far better than me. I'm going to be diving straight in to some of the deeper, murkier stuff. So does this gigantic new expansion to this gigantic, superb game make it even better? No. Not today. Not doing it. Sorry to be rude, you've invited me into your house. You've asked me kindly to take off my shoes, and I have. And I've put those shoes on the table. But listen, it's okay. Let me just soothe you with a gigantic caveat. If you're watching this because you want to know whether or not you should buy Prophecy of Kings, then the answer is probably not, no. But that is only because I can almost guarantee that anybody who might want this already definitely has it. And that's partly because we intended to make this video a long time ago and my plans got slowed down by a, a deadly virus, which is so TI thinking about it. Um, but it's also partly because this feels like it has been made for a specific type of player. And I don't know if it pleases that kind of player, but it certainly isn't for me. And so now, pushing forwards onto this lightly scorched earth, this is Prophecy of Kings, kindly provided to us by Fantasy Flight Games. And with a level of boldness here that I genuinely deeply respect, this isn't just a box of modular toys to add into the game, as you will. No, this is something that you're intended to fold into the game completely. The manual starts off by telling you, hey, take these things out of Twilight Imperium and put these new things in in order to make this whole box become one uber joined box that then all works together in a new harmony. But that's kind of frightening. It's sort of Cyberman style transformation that there's no coming back from. Unless you put all the bits you take out in a little baggie and then you go through and fish out all these new bits again afterwards. Frankly, to me though, that seems unfathomable. Either way, this isn't intended as some holiday destination that you just pop into as and when you want. No, this wants to be your new house that you live in. And this house has some pretty exciting rooms. We've got a brand new unit in the form of these wonderfully tutti fruity mechs you can see here piled up unceremoniously. You've got artifacts that you can uncover by finding different shards on different planets. Artifact shards, powerful artifacts, already music to my ears. Seven brand new factions. You've got a second little slidey bit that comes out of your main board on the other side. How much table space do these people think I have? Onto these boards go leaders. There's three different types of leaders, agents, commanders, and heroes, adding further depth to each of the original factions within the game. So you've got loads of new planets to explore, including weird planets that do weird things. You've got a mini exploration deck for finding weird stuff on the edge of space. Two new action things, one of which is slightly tweaked and the other one is exactly the same but just written in a slightly more clear way. Thanks for that, I suppose. Two new colours of ships, genuinely exciting. 
Hot pink, my favorite color. Hot orange, my second favorite color. Camouflaged on this tablecloth. Uh, eight new research cards for each player. Eight new things to add to your research deck. New objectives that get popped in. There's definitely stuff I've missed. Any aspect of the game that already existed, it's adding or tweaking new things to, and then it's adding four or five brand new mechanics. There's an awful lot going on. Twilight Imperium holds a very special place in the collective heart of Sharpens It Down. To the extent that we made a documentary on it, and yeah, Quinns may have decided to give me his copy of the game because he decided he, he maybe preferred Eclipse, but I think he's already starting to regret that. No backs, he's sorry Quinns, it's, it's fine now. And yeah, I don't think there's anything like it. It's this colourful box of space magic that conjures up an event, you know, block a day off in the diary, tell your loved ones you're not going to be home till late and you're going to be knackered, and you might come home changed, a different person. It's not you, it's me. I developed the tech to go through asteroid fields and I just want to go and see what's over there. And in terms of how I play it, TI is almost more like a mega game than a traditional board game. Each of these aliens in the game come with a comedically chunky set of boots for players to fill. And each of these factions have a really memorably silhouetted archetype. Horrid bugs do good fighting. Robot virus steal your brain. Wise lion make hot deals. Creepy plant wants to chat. Creepy plant in your area right now. Right now. And sadly, right off the bat with Prophecy of Kings, there's very little of the clean and simple fun of the characters that you'd seen in the base game. Marvel Robot, Bird Man, Space Face, Billy No Mate. But out of these seven, only two of these factions meet that bill of being immediately evocative and memorable. Crunchy space dinosaurs that will temporarily eat your ships and weird alien friend that can jump through nebulas. Our people have traveled through the very absence of time and space. I brought some fancy crisps. I thought we could put them in a bowl. Those two generally kind of pop off and you think, oh yeah, I remember them, they do that. Now admittedly, not all of the original cast of fourth edition was solid gold. Humans, as you'd expect, pretty boring. But we knew, like, I mean, they're in very enjoyable for everyone else to hate, which is, which is a, a plus. The pirates are kind of just on the line of being thematically a bit boring, but I think they're just okay. But even then, you know, the base game came with 17 different factions to play as. And almost all of them, you can flick through that deck and you go, yep, yep, oh yeah, oh yeah. Space fish, do science. And these two dimensional factoids that you really easily absorb are important, not just for keeping the game tight and flowing, but also just to encourage a little bit of light role play. You know, in the same way that you would do by having simple archetypes in a mega game. You're a scientist, you're a soldier, you're the actual Pope. And I think to a degree, everybody who plays TI loves that part of the game. But it's just the cherry atop a pyramid of information that I think is dividing the types of people who play this game. And oh my gosh, there is so much information within this game. All these different units to remember, all these different things you can research in your own little private deck, including faction specific stuff, secret objectives, secret action cards. But the thing is, based on how I play this game, I'm not sure that familiarity with all of this is something you're ever supposed to actually have. Because for me, the purpose of this dizzying web of potentials isn't to work it out, to suss out how it all works. No, no, no. The purpose is fuzziness, the gentle obfuscation. And I don't just mean like not knowing what's going on with other players. I mean, when I play Twilight Imperium, quite often I don't know what's going on with me. I don't exactly know what I'm doing. In the early game, all of this information is very manageable. But as the day stretches on and brains get gently slapped by the big wet rubber glove of fatigue, you realize that that tech you researched to solve that one specific problem two hours ago, you've forgotten to use it since. Also, you've got this thing and that thing and that planet gets plus one to that and you forgot about all of that too. 
But honestly, that's fine, because the only thing that matters now, four hours into the game, is that you crush that bastard lion. And so here's the problem. I like to play TI like it's a mega game, but <sighs> mega games are unknowable. You know, at the end of the day, they're being constantly conjured up by a bunch of wobbling human brains. You can't keep up with that. This is something you can fully understand. You can get to a point where every threat, every inference, you already kind of know which action card they're going to play because you've seen them all and you just have the gut feeling for it. Now, that's interesting, but I'm never going to get there and I don't want to get there for reasons that I'll come back to soon. And the reason why I'm doing double backwards backflips here to try and conjure up an image of who might play this game in a way that I don't, which is not a good practice for a critic, I'm just gonna put that out there, is because I am just desperately trying to understand who Prophecy of Kings is for. And I can only presume that it's for people who really want TI to be expanded with more stuff down here that keeps you focused on what's happening on the table. For me, I've already got way too much of that. And I don't want anything being taken away from the bit up here, which for me is where the game lives. And although, yes, I don't want loads more things to look at on the table, some of the new ideas in this are really cool. The way that leaders give you these different abilities that you can unlock during a game by achieving mini achievements. It tickles all of the little parts of my brain that go, ooh, games. But in reality, it's just another thing that you have to remember. And another thing that you're expecting other players to care about sufficiently to actively keep an eye on what you're doing. We found that this had completely the opposite effect and we just weren't paying attention to what everyone else was doing. There's too much to absorb to the point where you just create mental walls around yourself. Because it's like, I've got three different sets of secret cards. I've got three different types of objective I'm going for. I've got potentially four different powers I might be able to unlock on my faction sheet. I don't have the mental space to be thinking about what you might do with your commander power in two or three turns. And so because I can't get into that headspace, no, just not doing any of it, not thinking about it. Don't know what's going on. And this is a really, really, really big problem because TI is all about having plans. It's all about being like, I've got this master plan, it's gonna work because A, B, C, no, look, I've got this card, as you go and explain to someone in the kitchen to get them involved in your fabulous conspiracy. As soon as you start having turns in a game of TI where you go, well, I guess I'll just do this, because you realize, actually, you can't think about everything, so there's no point thinking, well, I'll just do this. That's death. You can't have that, you can't, be playing a game of TI and not be invested in what is happening, either thematically or mechanically. And on a basic level, I think when you add more cranial crunch to a game that will often see your plans being derailed by a bad roll of some dice or somebody having a quite unexpected card in their hands, that is just a recipe for saltiness and sadness. Up until this point, it's just been personal differences, right? It's been like, this is how I play the game. This doesn't gel with it. But there's some stuff in here that isn't great. And there's some stuff in here that I think, even if it's what people wanted, it wasn't the right approach to take in expanding on this game. Because honestly, the addition of all of these things that enhances the depth of the strategic part of the game, well, it just shines a light on something that was already true, turning it up to be a little bit brighter, revealing the fact that Twilight Imperium just isn't a great strategy game. That's not to say it's a bad one. It's just exactly as good as it needs to be for the rest of the experience to work. So listen, hear me out here. What exactly is the game in TI? Well, at the center of the table, we've got the jewel in the crown of Mechatol Rex. Nobody dares to take it, but somebody will. And at that point, everyone else will start talking. Grabbing that planet will get you points, but winning the game really comes from achieving these objectives. And the thing about these objectives is there's a bit of a disconnect here between 
what they want you to do during the game and what you as players probably want to be doing. But it's one of those classic examples of the fact that design rules are useful, but breaking them is sometimes the way you make things great. You don't want to do this stuff particularly. It doesn't, it's nothing to do with being a space turtle. Why should I care? But the fact is, by forcing players to concentrate on doing these things in between doing all the things that they want to do, it allows the game to ensure that there is constant exponential friction between allies and enemies and borders on the board. It forces you to be constantly trying to negotiate for slightly more than seems fair, to be pushing out into territories that in a way, slightly doesn't seem reasonable, ensuring that everything is constantly a little bit tense, but crucially, doing so in a way that always gives players that ability to say, well, look, it's not really my fault. I was, I had, you know, I was doing an objective. If this game had objectives that only one player could achieve, then it wouldn't work. It's the fact that you're all trying to do the same thing that allows this to be a shared pool of solidarity for basically poor behavior. You can get away with stretching things a little bit further than you should have done because people understand why and they'll probably be doing the same thing next turn as long as nobody pushes their luck and tries to snag more of these than they should at a pace which is kind of silently agreed upon. There's never any rules about it, but if you've got five points in the first two turns, frankly, that's gauche. I think we should annihilate them. And Prophecy of Kings undermines this communal sense of empathy by having players not just focusing on this during the game, but also focusing on their own set of mini objectives to achieve in order to unlock new powers on that faction sheet, creating pinch points in the game where I've just been a bit of a dick to somebody else for a reason that they can't directly relate to. And that in itself is a tiny pipette of poison. And listen, that's a really understandable misstep of the design, but there's some stuff in here that just seems a bit sloppy. One of the new factions, their whole thing is that they hate another one of the new factions, which doesn't seem like the ideal setup for an afternoon of politics and negotiation. And the folks that they hate, well, they've every reason to. Their entire thing is just that they're bastards. That's it. And this flatness, as I mentioned earlier, just gets in the way of you feeling thematically engaged with the game, but also, it causes issues in terms of having that diminished sense of responsibility that you need in a game where sometimes you have to be mean. If I'm playing as the necrovirus and I start to play and behave in a way which maybe isn't terribly nice, that's not going to come as a shock to anybody. Whereas when I played as the Mahak gene sorcerers during a game, four or five times I had to kind of apologize to people around the table and say, I'm sorry, these folks, they're just dicks, which is something that the faction design should have done for me. And again, so many of these issues might be dampened over time by familiarity with the game and the systems. If you are that person and you've got this and you love it, I am happy for you. But I think for most people who play and love TI, Prophecy of Kings is just gonna make the game wilder, less predictable and harder to pass in ways which aren't fun. And the wildness thing is an odd one for me to be complaining about. I developed technology via this artifact that allowed me to destroy a planet. As a lifelong fan of Cosmic Encounter, that should have been a really exciting thing to do. But in reality, I was so bamboozled by all of the new systems, I couldn't think of a good reason to do it. I honestly thought that I want to play around with more stuff that was wild and wacky, but actually the balance was already perfect. And that stuff just distracted me from keeping an eye on the objectives. And the only thing that should distract me from keeping an eye on the objectives in a game of TI is social interactions with other players. That is the tug of war of the whole game. And it felt like this box of things just, in my mind, failed to kind of understand that. If core TI is a great pretzel, dotted with chunks of salt, but ultimately pleasant and slightly squishy, then Prophecy of Kings is maybe one that's gone a bit stale very chewy and stays around for such a length of time that the salt really does start to stick around longer than you want it to. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, eating a stale pretzel just makes you think, oh, wouldn't it be great if I was eating a fresh pretzel right now? And that is, that's really what it boils down to for me. This is not a bad 
box of things. This is not a terrible expansion, yeah? It's just that in asking me to play this, you're asking me to not play this. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to play this. If your life has got another flip knows how many games of TI in it, then hey, fill your boots. But maybe I've only got 15, 20 games of TI left in my whole life. And that's probably a high estimate. Do I really want to take the chance of, of playing something that's not going to be as enjoyable as this? And for me, the answer is just a cold, hard no. It's just, it's too, there's too much risk that things get derailed and become not fun in a way which, frankly, is already a risk with TI, if we're being honest. So that's the thing. Now, finally, what about if you already have this? Here's the tricky part. What about if you've bought this and maybe you haven't played it much yet because of pandemics? What's the scenario now? Is there anything in here that makes this redeemable? Well, this is where it gets tricky because it isn't modular. You, you take it all or you leave it, but there is stuff in here that you can take. First of all, the pink pieces and the orange pieces. Honestly, I'm having these. These are great. And with them, all of the cards and tiny bits and bobs that you forget about that you're gonna need in order to play an eight player game, including just the tiles that let you make massive galaxies with special highways that let you nip around them more easily. Some of the factions you might be able to use in the main game. I really like the idea of bringing in the big dinosaurs. Don't know if they'd be massively unbalanced or not. Don't know how much that matters. I'm sure that people on the internet will work out which bits of this you can strip out and use effectively in the base game without causing too much chaos. But yeah, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that you're just gonna have to forget about if you don't want this whole new experience, including a bag of multicolored mechs. But don't get too sour about that because actually they've done a pretty rubbish job on the production of this and the colors of the plastic don't even match. Uh, for any of the original factions, which is kind of not a big deal, but in a game which is so crisp and glossy and nice, it's very disappointing. And as a final note, it is truly rare at Shut Up and Sit Down that we make videos like this. I don't like to sit here and be pretty wholly negative for an entire video, but in this case, it really does come from a place of love. I love Twilight Imperium, and that's nice. So I hope you appreciate why I've had to be mean about this expansion, because I love this. If you want to watch, uh, if you want to feel the love as well, and you're not feeling it right now for whatever reason, do go and check out either our Twilight Imperium documentary, which I edited. It was hellish, but it came together really nicely. It's a fun thing to watch. Quince's original review, get hype. And possibly if you're looking for something of this scale, but that is more strategic, and you're not interested in all of this talking to people around the table guff that I keep going on about, then do check out our review of Eclipse. Mmm, Eclipse. It's just a nice word to say. That's all we have time for today, so keep on being in space, pretend style. <laughs>